Hello everyone. Today's podcast episode is going to be featured on both of my podcasts, both the Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast and the Optimistic Future podcast. And I'm going to be the one that's interviewing myself today. Essentially, I have a little presentation that I put together um, on healthy habits to raise healthy kids. Um, the reason that I feel that this uh, podcast topic pertains to both podcasts is because having healthy kids is super important um, because Having healthy kids will hopefully increase the likelihood of having healthy adults into the future and might minimize the risk of them developing a complex chronic illness. So hence the application to the Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast. Um, and of course, there are some uh, chronic illnesses that affect children as well, um, such as um, you know, PANS and PANDAS, and uh, there can be challenges um, with, uh, say, a you know, diagnostic label of ADHD, or it can be some health challenges if someone's on the autism spectrum or, or different um, uh, factors like that. So there's kind of the, the Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast, a Relevance, and then uh, my other podcast, um, An Optimistic Future. Um, <clears throat> I think that encouraging good health in our children is something, uh, for our children, is something that's important for just our communities at large. Um, you know, when our kids are happy and healthy, then it allows the adults that are in charge of those kids, be it their you know, parents or grandparents or guardians or other caregivers to um, be able to focus on other things like goodness knows like you know in the past some of my kids I have three three boys um, you know sometimes they're like oh man like that that cold's pretty bad they've got you know they're spiking a fever like it's you know it's, it's stressful and like just everything else you know nothing else matters uh, when when your kids are you know feeling unwell and of course they've, they've always been fine thankfully um, but I think having um, healthy children and just not um, needing to to worry about the health of our kids super important so if we can kind of encourage those healthy habits um, keep our kids as healthy as possible I think that that's uh, important on many levels, and I think it has a, a relevance to the um, overcoming or to the uh, optimistic future uh, podcast as well. So, um, hopefully, regardless of which podcast uh, you're listening to, um, you'll have some interest in this topic, and uh, I'll try to share the information that I think is relevant. Um, the reason that I am you know, I put this uh, inter uh, this um, uh, presentation together myself, I'm I'm not, not really interviewing myself, and normally interview other people, of course, for the podcast. Um, but the reason that I'm doing this talk myself is because I've been, for folks that follow me on the Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast, you're probably aware I've been a naturopathic doctor now in practice for about 15 years, so I have a lot of uh, experience working with um, uh, many, many patients over the years, thousands of patients, but uh, many of those patients have been pediatric patients, and uh, either uh, patients who have uh, just more, shall we say, you know, run-of-the-mill health challenges like eczema or constipation or asthma or things like that, which, of course, some of those conditions can be quite serious, not downplaying that at all, um, but in contrast to, say, more um, severe challenges like, you know, um, uh, say, again, kids with autoimmune inflammatory issues, um, you know, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, uh, neurodevelopmental issues that are challenges, that type of thing. <clears throat> um, for folks who are listening to this interview um, through the <clears throat> Overcoming chronic illness, or so, <laughs> too many podcasts. Um through the uh, Optimistic Future podcast, um, then um, now, now you know. Um, I, I'm a naturopathic doctor. I've been practicing for about 15 years, and um, that's why I feel I have a, a good amount of authority to talk on this topic. Um, <clears throat> this episode was inspired by one of my um, employees, actually. I was asking her about her thoughts about the um, Optimistic Future podcast, actually, and um, she was saying, like, you know, I just would really love an, to, uh, to hear an episode about uh, more about like healthy diet options um, for for kids and so anyways I started thinking about the episode it's like well I think maybe just talking about kind of healthy habits in general and then sat down put together this little powerpoint and it bloomed into what it is here so anyways that's the background and uh, that's that's why it's um, going to be featured or that it is now featured by the time you're listening to this it's no longer in the future <clears throat> um It'll be featured for um, on both podcasts um so without further ado let's jump into this So as folks who listen to my Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast episode um, or who follow me on social media would know, I put out this disclaimer all the time. I usually don't have to for the Optimistic Future podcast episodes because we're not talking about health-related topics, but just where we are in this case, um, I will mention here that the content in this podcast episode is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as medical advice. If you need medical advice, please speak to your healthcare provider uh, to provide that advice or to obtain rather that advice. 
So quick rundown about what we'll talk about here, what I'll be discussing here. So uh, dietary considerations, um, again, inspired by my wonderful um, employee. Um, the important, <clears throat> excuse me, the benefits of outside time, um, minimizing chemical exposure, movement, uh, screen time, and something called attachment parenting. So when I put this presentation together, I was thinking, you know, what are some of the things that I've learned over my time of as being a parent? Uh, my oldest is about two months shy of being 18 years old. Um, so I've been parenting him for quite a while now. I was thinking about his health when he was gestating in utero as well. So a little, little over 18 years now of, um, of you know, thinking about um, the, these types of things. Um, my firstborn was born when I was still in naturopathic school. So even before I started working with pediatric patients, then I have uh, been thinking about these things. So over the course of time, um, just through continuing education and things that have come across my radar, things that have come across my wife's radar. She's a naturopathic doctor as well. So she kind of looks at things, not just through the, the parental eye, um, but also through the, the healthcare um, provider eye as well. Um, these are some of the things that I think are, uh, I'm, I'm the most pleased that I learned about um, either through my clinical practice and clinical experience or um, just through um, other, you know, out, uh, learning outside of that. And then just seeing, you know, what are the things that seem to have, have seemed to have been the most impactful or important for um, my ability to parent as well as I feel like I can, and also for the um, health of, of my children and, and hopefully encouraging their, their health into the future. Also kind of retroactively looking at some of the things that uh, may have impacted my health or my wife's health or some of my adult patients health and then looking and seeing how oh it probably would have been a good thing if you know our parents knew about these things uh, which you know of course life is a journey um, and you know can't know everything out of the gate uh, certainly so um, we just always do the best that we can as parents um, and this is uh, what's uh, the, this was kind of the mindset that I had around compiling this list. So certainly not an exhaustive list of all the things that I think are important for kids, but uh, these are some of the more uh, ones that um, I think are I'm the most excited to talk about. I think some of the most relevant and hopefully covering a lot of ground here. So in terms of dietary considerations, <clears throat> I think that, and, and again, this is the approach that I take with my children. This is the approach that I uh, will generally counsel my, uh, the parents of my pediatric patients. We don't always get into the nitty gritty of dietary considerations, you know, if, it's not, not always a, a, a hallmark thing. So, uh, but when we do talk about diet, which is in, in a majority of my pediatric cases, but um, these are some of the principles that I, you know, we embody in my household. And then also that I generally will emphasize for um, the majority of my pediatric patients. And a lot of this spills over into adult health as well. Um, but the rules in my mind, at least for kids are a little bit different because their metabolic needs are different. You know, they're of course growing you know, rapidly, you know, as adults, we're still growing in that we have to, uh, you know, re replenish, we're still, uh, we, cellular regeneration, uh, cellular division is still important, whether we're exercising and trying to put on more muscle mass or we're replacing old cells that have you know, reach the end of their viable lifespan. And now we have to replace them with new ones after the, they've been sort of destroyed through apoptosis. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, of course, children uh, compared to us fully grown uh, folks, uh, fully, fully grown humans, they have a much higher energy demand. So, you know, whereas uh, in my experience and in my opinion, a lot of adults, we unless we're very, very active, you know, we don't really need like say tons of carbohydrates. So whereas for kids, we'll see something coming up here where, you know, I'll say, well, yeah, fruit juice, like not a terrible thing for kids. Adults probably don't really ever need to drink fruit juice. You know, it's fine to do it free country. Hopefully wherever you live is a free country. Um, uh, folks around the world listen to this. So don't, don't know what, what's applying to everybody, but, um, you know, it's something that we really generally don't need that like huge shot of, you know, carbohydrates and calories in the form of juice. Whereas with kids, it's not necessarily the healthiest thing to consume all the time, in my opinion. But if we are going to give our kids juice, it's like, well, okay, have the juice when you're about to burn a bunch of energy, like here, drink this juice and now go play outside for two hours. Um, don't drink this juice and then try to sit still in a classroom for two hours. I mean, again, whatever parents want to do with their kids, it's a, uh, it's, it's challenge. Uh, managing kids is not the easiest thing in the world. There's certainly no uh, finite playbook, but um, this, this is where some of the uh, recommendations will kind of differ for for adults and for children. But anyways, getting off on a tangent there. Um, so uh, protein, in my opinion, is very important. Uh, we need to make sure kids are getting a lot of protein and 
really it's one of the main drivers for um, growth processes in our cells. It's really important to make all of our enzymes and uh, muscle tissue and, and bones and et cetera, et cetera. Everything is structured in our bodies, um, have a protein component to it in terms of structural development and growth. Um, <clears throat> Now, one of the things with kids that we thankfully don't have to really worry about, to my understanding, is that when they're consuming protein, it's okay if they you kind of load the protein in at certain times of the day. So for adults, to my understanding, it's pretty important for us to be getting protein in throughout the day. Now, getting away for, or uh, bearing in mind that some folks, you know, good, a good option for them is say intermittent fasting. Other people, not so much. They need to eat three square meals a day, or some people should be grazers through the day. It really depends on the case. But with adults, we generally want to space our protein out through the day or spread it out through the day because uh, we just can't make full use of it all at once. If I need 100 grams of protein or 60 grams of protein or whatever it is for my daily needs based on my size and um, uh, activity level, then <clears throat> um, for me as a fully grown individual, I probably shouldn't eat all of that all at once. I should really try to space it out maybe in two or three divided um, doses, so to speak, of protein through the day. For children, to my understanding, it doesn't really matter. Their physiology is such that their um, bodies will just kind of use that protein and really won't won't waste it even if it's more front loaded or back loaded in the day. So as much as for my kids, you know, my wife and I strive to get, well, and, and succeed really. We've been at it for a while now, but uh, gen generally are successful at getting protein into them every meal of the day. If there's a situation where it's like, you know, I just cannot get my kid to eat protein at breakfast time, but you know, we do pretty well at lunch and he eats tons of meat at dinner, for example, it's like, that's okay. You know, we don't have to worry about it quite as much for the, you know, spacing out for the, the little humans that are out there. Um, so protein is important though. And so when I and when my wife and I are structuring meals for our kids, then it's kind of like, okay, let's start with the protein because that's what we feel is the most important. And then we'll add the, you know, fat and carbs and, and uh, you know, uh, thinking about micronutrients and whatnot on, t um, on top of that. Um, another, you know, I think important principle, I'm sure this isn't a surprise to anyone, but refined sugar is not healthy. I'm um, trying to minimize our intake of refined sugar as a species, I think is probably a very, very good idea. That's a huge topic. Um, but, um, I think the, 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 uh, sort of discussion is fairly settled that we're all quite aware that refined sugar is not healthy. So that would be, you know, our, um, you know, cane sugar, um, high fructose corn syrup. Um, if on the label it says glucose fructose um, or sucrose, you know, these are refined sugars. Um, so trying to keep those to a minimum as much as possible, I think is important. Um, I do have some thoughts that I'll share here in the upcoming slides about, you know, thoughts around what's a good, uh, what are healthy or, or good options for say breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, that kind of thing. So we'll see that there are refined sugar free options there. Um, I think that organic is worth considering, or at the very least trying to consume spray free, um, foods if, if possible, vegetables, if possible. <clears throat> um, I had a wonderful interview with a woman named Lara Adler. She's a health coach and she has the, her handle on Instagram is environmental toxins nerd. <clears throat> um, I actually posted our interview on both podcast platforms as well, because it, uh, toxins, uh, chemical, um, uh, toxic chemicals, uh, applied certainly to our health from a chronic illness perspective. And then also from an environmental health and, um, I think just general uh, human health perspective for the, for the overcoming or for the optimistic future podcast as well. So that was posted in, I don't know, February or March of 2024. So it's a, uh, it was a great interview and she's certainly worth following on social media and, um, anyways, uh, good chat. And I won't uh, beleaguer the point here. Um, but when it comes to avoiding chemicals, I think that there's, it's something that we should, in my opinion, should try to avoid as best we can. Now I'm very, uh, aware of and sympathetic to the fact that, especially in nowadays where I'm recording this in, uh, you know, April of 2024, uh, inflation is, is a real thing. Um, groceries are getting more and more expensive and, you know, not everybody can afford to eat organic and that's, that's okay. Um, you know, we just, we always just need to try to do the best we can. It's like, you know, I just can't buy any organically grown produce. That's okay. Um, obviously we just make the best choices that we can for ourselves and our families. It is worthwhile to consider looking up what's called the dirty dozen list. Uh, there's a, a group called the, oh my goodness, I should have probably put the link in here, but didn't think of it. And too busy to go back and start recording this all over again. Um, but I believe it's put out by the, I think it's the environmental working group. I really hope it is. Anyways, you can just punch into a search engine, dirty dozen list, and it will have the top 12, um, uh, fruits and vegetables that are the most sprayed, like the most heavily sprayed. So those are the ones that in our household, we try to 
always get organic options on that list if we can, or if one can't afford to buy organic options, then just consider maybe minimizing your intake of those most heavily sprayed foods. Um, so it's like, oh, if apples are on the list this year, but pears aren't, okay, well, try buying pears instead of apples. And even if they're sprayed pears, at least there's less pesticide exposure. Um, and then another um, um, thing that I certainly look at in my patients and then also bearing in mind this consideration for my children is watching out for food sensitivities. And so uh, when it comes to food sensitivities, this is something that in the kind of integrative healthcare world, naturopathic medicine, functional medicine world, you know, we, we this is like the... 101 in that kind of sphere, but in more, um, you know, uh, traditional medicine, conventional, you know, sort of quote unquote mainstream medicine, this isn't really something that's talked about a whole heck of a lot. Um, and so just this idea of food sensitivities where if people think, oh, if my kid's reacting to a food, it's like, oh yeah, they've got a peanut allergy or they've got lactose intolerance or, you know, they ate strawberries and got hives. It's like, well, that's going to be likely to be more of a food allergy or maybe a, you know, if lactose intolerance is, you know, you just don't make the lactase enzyme, so you can't digest the protein or the sugar. So it gives you diarrhea. A food sensitivity is something that's more, um, harder it's much harder to put your finger on it um it's not, it, not always but in in a number of cases it is um so it's more like oh my kid has eczema why do they have eczema well you know we look in the medical textbook eczema is this idiopathic condition meaning we don't know what causes it um and yet um many kids in my experience and and certainly in the experience of other clinical practices you know they cut out gluten and then the eczema gets better or goes away or they cut out dairy the eczema gets better and goes away they cut out corn the eczema gets better or goes away um or the you know asthma symptoms get better or go away or the constipation issues or the gas and bloating gets better or goes away so these food sensitivities certainly don't apply to every case but for a number of conditions like the ones listed on the slide or if you're just listening to this while you're driving it says eczema asthma adhd constipation etc um, there are a number of uh, clinical like uh, a lot of the common or most common uh, health issues that might appear or arise for a child, um, in my experience, are oftentimes, um, not in every case, but oftentimes related to uh, or impacted by food sensitivities. So um, the, the punchline here is that if a child is... It, you know, having an issue with eczema, asthma, ADHD, constipation, or, or, or other issues, you know, rashes or hives or, um, you know, acne as they're, you know, getting into their preteens and teen years, um, maybe other behavioral challenges. Um, it's worthwhile to think, well, maybe there's a food sensitivity component here. Maybe I should talk to someone who knows about these things, could do a workup for that, whether it's, you know, blood testing or, or a therapeutic uh, trial diet or, or something like that. Um, one quick little note here. I just, um, always try to make, the, um, I, I think it's important to make note that, you know, ADHD, um, you know, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, for many years was, you know, very highly pathologized. It's like, oh, this is a disease. This is bad. Um, you know, the, the new way of thinking about that and in, in my opinion, the correct way of thinking about it is that, you know, ADHD, um, f fits into this category of something called neurodivergence. So the brain of someone with an ADHD label is different than a, you know, neurotypical non ADHD brain. Um, but it's not a bad or pathological thing. It's just a different kind of nervous system. Um, so I just want to make sure I emphasize that I, you know, listing all these other things, which are pathologies, you know, it's never good to have eczema. It's never good to have asthma. Um, but with ADHD, it's like, well, it's this neurodivergence, which can certainly make it mighty challenging in, you know, a traditional classroom setting and, and cause other challenges. Um, but that's really that it's kind of the environment's fault. It's not the brain's fault, so to speak. Um, with that being said, there have been um, a few research studies showing that when food sensitivities are identified and eliminated, then the pathological, or I should say the problematic um, issues associated with, or that folks with an AD, or children in these studies with an ADHD diagnosis experience are better. So it's like, oh, with ADHD, like I can hyper-focus on things. I can be more creative. I have all these good things with my brain, but ah, it's harder to focus in class, like on, you know, there I'm more easily distracted by sounds or I need to get up and move around more. Well, sort of those uh, more challenging uh, features uh, that some individuals, some children with an ADHD label have can be ameliorated. So it's like, oh, I still have all the benefits of my, you know, special, actually advantageous ADHD brain, but without the pathological or the um, uh, sort of problematic uh, issues or that can come along with that, so to speak. So you kind of have your cake and eat it too. Special enhanced brain and it's not interfering with day-to-day -day life as much. So that's uh, just a little clear clarification on that.
So just a few slides here about things to think about for different meals of the day or uh, different meals of the day. It's all well and good to say, oh, protein is important and, you know, refined sugar is bad and eat organic. But like, well, what what kind of things, you know, can we feed our kids? Um, <clears throat> so for breakfast and this, if memory serves, was what my employee was specifically saying, like, ah, like, what do I what do I feed my kid uh, for breakfast that doesn't have sugar in it? Um, so there are. Um, some good options out there, in my opinion. Um, there are low sugar cereals that are available. Like for example, my one little one, he loves these organic cornflakes. I personally feel that it's important for my family at least to purchase organic corn because the non-organic corn is genetically modified and whether or not a person's concerned about having genetically modified food in their body um, is, is one thing, but those genetically modified uh, grains uh, or um, other substances like soybeans or whatnot that are genetically modified, they are sprayed with uh, Roundup, which contains a chemical called glyphosate. And just looking at the research literature, kind of the emerging literature on that, I'm just not comfortable with um, feeding my children foods that have glyphosate residue in them. I think it's quite frankly very bad for us and I have a lot of concerns about it. So I'm just specifically mentioning here organic cornflakes. Um, a person said, you know, I just I can't afford to buy those organic cornflakes. Like, that's okay. Um, there's other, you know, um, uh, other uh, grains would be an option. You know, it could be um, non-organic rice puffs. I mean, with wheat, it is one of those things where I Preferably, it would be organic because even though wheat's not genetically modified, to my understanding, it's typically sprayed with glyphosate as a desiccating agent um, to help with its um, harvesting. Um, so, you know, organic corn, organic wheat are the ones that I think are the most important to pay attention to. But other grains, if it's like, oh, it's non-organic orts, uh, oats rather, <laughs> orts. I wonder what orts taste like. Um, if it's non-organic uh, oats, you know, I, I don't think that that's a particular problem uh, or not as much of a problem necessarily there wouldn't uh, be glyphosate involved in, in that for example um, so if a person was to use a low sugar cereal like they could sweeten it themselves or like my little guy who's you know pretty picky um, he doesn't have like these you know completely dulled like weird naturopathic taste buds like oh yeah we'll just get him like you know roots out of the ground and he's happy chewing on those like no he's, he's, he's pretty picky love him to pieces he's pretty picky um, so with him you know he has his organic cornflakes we put unsweetened almond milk on there we put um, blueberries on there and he's just happy as a lark you know eating those uh, but for other kids especially if they're kind of used to like oh I'm used to eating you know um, regular Cheerios or uh, Fruit Loops or something like that. And it's like, oh, we're going to try to, you know, phase them into something like this. Um, you could, uh, you could always add some sweetener to the milk. So in the past, um, in for various reasons in certain contexts, you know, we've added like a little bit of pure maple syrup or a little bit of honey. Um, so at least we're getting what I feel are, you know, a healthier sweetener in the mix as opposed to the refined sugar, which also to my understanding, a lot of um, sugar cane is also desiccated with glyphosate uh, with Roundup. So there's that uh, pesticide component there too with standard sugar. Um, there's also, you know, at the grocery store, other places, uh, low sugar waffles, uh, breakfast bars, muffins, or pancakes. Um, I have a couple of slides coming up with some recipes that uh, just out of my little, I have some handouts, uh, recipe handouts for my patients. So I just cut and pasted a couple of those. Um, smoothies can be a good option. Not every kid likes them, but it's a really, if they do like them, it's um, you know, quite a, I think, tasty way to get you know good nutrition into into a child. And um, so you know, uh, just a simple recipe would be unsweetened almond milk, uh, a banana for the sweetness, um, some kind of fruit. So you know, strawberries, blueberries, whatever it is, or actually nut butter. Uh, my oldest, um, yeah, I don't make smoothies for him anymore because he's certainly a uh, well equipped to make his own breakfast nowadays um but uh, we would actually add uh, he loved uh, these peanut butter banana smoothies like they're really really tasty kind of like a peanut butter milkshake very very nice and then you can add protein powder in there as well so you're getting the protein there's no refined sugar and can be a good option um you know it's nice to get, have a bit of variety for our kids i think so i could you know at once upon a time when i was in charge of breakfast my uh, I, I, my wife is in charge of the kids breakfast now most of the time except on the weekends but anyways it doesn't matter uh, when I was driving the boat it was you know a smoothie you know a couple of days a week and we'd have you know um, oatmeal a couple of days a week and then I'd make them pancakes on the weekend uh, when it was just the one oldest one uh, kicking around so um, you know, it's nice to have some options to kind of switch things up we don't have to feed our kids the same thing every day um, and then you know what about that Protein. So yeah, the smoothie protein powder, wonderful. Um, but what about the non smoothie days? So there could of course be scrambled eggs, fried eggs, whatever, you know, eggs are a good traditional uh, protein source in, in, um, you know, 
Western cultures. Um, I think they're wonderful and delicious, um, but it doesn't have to be eggs. Um, you know, parents will sometimes say to me like, ah, my kid just, you know, doesn't like eggs. And like, what am I going to give and doesn't want a smoothie every day or doesn't like smoothies. What am I going to give them for protein in the morning? Well, it, you know, it's, it's kind of this funny, um, tradition here where it's like, oh, like, if somebody said, you know, I, I eat a pork chop for breakfast every morning, it's like, oh, what a weirdo. Or like, oh, I eat ground beef for breakfast every morning. Oh, that's strange. Well, why is it strange? You know, it doesn't really matter. What's so special about breakfast? It's not like our digestive tracts can't consume um, meat protein early in the morning. So um, my youngest, my six-year-old, he loves ground beef. He would eat it every meal of the day. Um, and so you know, we, we usually feed him eggs in the morning, but, um, you know, I'd have no problem giving him ground beef for when we've been on vacation. Sometimes that's, that's what he's had for breakfast and that's fine. You know, so it could be, um, eggs are a good option. Meat's an option. If your kids like nuts or seeds or, you know, butters of those, um, you know, if, uh, I'm trying to be, uh, uh, um, sensitive and, and, uh, to the, uh, you know, vegan or vegetarians that might be listening. I'm, I'm uh, don't have a ton of experience with that, uh, with my patients, but I've, you know, my, uh, sister who's who's a vegetarian she uh you know does these organic tofu scrambles like so there's there's different uh options um that are out there for protein in the morning just to say complement the muffins or pancakes or what have you so um, here's a recipe for almond flour breakfast bars they're quite delicious if i do say so myself uh, for folks who are listening um the time stamp here it's around 25 minutes and 45 seconds or so um into the recording so I'll, uh, and this will of course be on the YouTube channel, uh, for both uh, podcasts as well. So I will, um, so you could you know, screenshot this or, or pause it or whatnot, but anyways, that's the timestamp for that one. Here's an almond flour muffin recipe. Timestamp is 26 minutes and about five seconds. And then here's a recipe for gluten-free pancakes. Uh, they're rice flour based, although one could use, um, other flowers like a gluten-free flour or wheat flour whatever you so choose um and the timestamp there is 26 minutes and 20 seconds or so i have to plug in my computer it might uh, glitch the recording here so i'm going to hit pause and uh, hopefully it won't sound too glitchy when i unpause all right and then uh, some thoughts about uh, dietary considerations for lunch <clears throat> so again some type of protein, meat, nuts, seeds, beans, lentils, that type of thing. Um, so there could be bread involved, uh, you know, whether it's wheat or gluten-free or low carb, like kind of a keto bread or paleo bread, as it's sometimes called, which would be more almond flour based as a rule, or, or maybe psyllium husk based. Uh, again, for kids, for the most part, I find that um, as long as a child's not gluten sensitive, then gluten free is usually fine. I don't usually find that low carb is overly important for um, kids unless they have some really notable digestive issues. Um, but anyways, there there are exceptions to that out there. But um, sometimes a, a gluten free bread might have some other food trigger in it. So there could be say potato starch in there, or some corn in there, or um, uh, you know, some, not very often, but some, you know, kids have issues with rice, you know, there's rice flour in there as a rule. Um, so sometimes those low carb options, cause they're, you know, say almond flour based, um, can be a better, better options. So that's why I included that in there. But again, that's really only if there are food sensitivity issues. Um, rice, rice crackers, uh, there's corn based, uh, tortillas out there. Um, and then say chopped veggies or some other type of veggie. So again, kind of using my own kids as a, uh, um, a, a uh, uh, example here. So, you know, common lunches for them would be having some type of meat. So whether it's ground beef or it's, you know, chicken that's heated up from the night before, or, um, you know, sometimes we'll do, we get shaved deli ham from a local farmer, um, uh, um, uh, Amy Hill's farm. So, uh, Amy was interviewed on my, um, optimistic future podcast. I think she was episode number two with memory serves. So she has a wonderful, uh, you know, small scale farm at, uh, here in Nova Scotia, here in Canada. And, uh, anyway, so just a little plug for that episode and her farm, just wonderful, wonderful pork products that she raises with love and care. And it's a, yeah, wonderful, uh, place to get get meat from um and and eggs and veggies and things like that um so uh, yeah they'll have some, some type of meat and then usually you know we kind of 
will have some type of carbs. So whether it's, you know, rice crackers, um, maybe a, a tortilla thing. Um, it might be, uh, heated up rice from the night before, maybe noodles from the night, like, no, <clears throat> excuse me, noodles from the night before. Um, and then some type of veggie. So whether it's, you know, chopped carrots, um, chopped cucumber, um, they love squash soup. Um, <laughs> so, they, so sometimes it's squash soup. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, cooked beets from the night before. Or sometimes it's sweet potatoes. So those are just some, uh, uh, common lunches that they, they would have. And then for supper, um, you know, same, same kind of thing. So, you know, maybe making things a little bit switched up for the carb uh, side of things. So as, again, for folks who are just listening, again, it says meat, nuts and seeds, beans, lentils. So again, for my kids, it would typically be some type of meat, you know, it might be something a bit fancier, like say pork chops, or we'll have spaghetti, uh, you know, spaghetti sauce, which uh, would have a, a meat base to it. Of course, there could be uh, vegetarian options in there as well. We just eat a lot of meat and animal products in our house because that seems to work the best for our family. Um, <clears throat> other sides could be, again, rice again, could be potato, could be sweet potato, maybe organic corn, uh, maybe pasta, whether that's, you know, wheat-based pasta or gluten-free pasta. Um, so some type of carb there. <clears throat> and then again, veggies. And in our household, we typically be more prone to doing, uh, you know, having cooked veggies um, in the evening. Um, and as it says here on the slide, it could be carrots, beets, squash, again, mentioned squash soup again, um, things like that. And for snacks, um, so just, you know, little thought provoking um, question here it just says, you know, what is the culture around snacks or dessert um, in your home? So like with our kids, um, they will typically we'll have a mid morning snack as a rule, um, or, um, I should say not necessarily as a rule, maybe like 50% of the time, give or take. Um, and I have some snack examples here coming up. Um, but they don't really snack a lot through the day. And I think in large part, because they, um, have really balanced meals at each meal of the day. I, I think that, um, what I've seen in <clears throat> my pediatric patient population and certainly in my adult population is that a lot of um, folks, you know, pediatric or adult, they don't um, eat enough protein in the morning, sometimes don't eat any protein in the morning. It's like, oh, or, or, or yeah, at least at least not enough. So it's like, oh, I'm going to have my bowl of, you know, some traditional cereal, maybe with some cow's milk. So yep, you're getting some protein in there with the cow's milk, but not enough um, by and large. And then of course, you know, a couple hours later, like oh, I'm hungry. And so there's a snack and, and that's fine. There's nothing. I mean, when it comes to snacking, I think especially for kids, it's, it's all good. Kids are just meant to grow. So I don't think we can really go wrong with the snacking. In most cases, there are exceptions to that. Um, but <clears throat> Um, I think that it speaks to the, um, in some cases, speaks to the nutrient composition in the meals of the day if snacks are something that are really desperately needed. Um, so, uh, again, it's okay if kids are snacking and, you know, not giving any health advice here or anything like that, but it's just something to think about where it's like, oh, if, if there's an observation, like, yeah, you know, we really haven't been getting that much protein in with breakfast. You know, it has just been kind of like more of a carb centric kind of extravaganza started eating more protein. Oh, you know, little Bobby doesn't really, you know, seem to need a snack, you know, mid morning or doesn't seem to be needing to snack as much. Um, that can make a big, a significant difference, I think. Um, so again, not saying that snacks are a problem or, um, snacks are a bad thing, but just the reason I bring this up is because one of the challenges that a lot of parents run into is like, oh, what are some healthy snacks? You know, I only have so much time in the day. I can't be, you know, making my own healthy snacks. A lot of the stuff at the grocery store, there are better and better options out there, but they, you know, oftentimes will have some preservative in there, or maybe one or two ingredients that we're not overly enamored with, um, or they're really healthy, <laughs> they're really healthy or like the, uh, you know, least, uh, or the non chemically laden options are just really, really expensive. Or I know in our household, you know, we certainly, you know, like to be frugal with our groceries as best we can. But also I just think about the packaging. Uh, you know, we don't want to be, you know, creating more garbage by, you know, having these individually wrapped snacks and things like that. So, um, I think that if we can optimize our kids meals, then that might lead to a, uh, lower need to emphasize snacks. And then that can kind of help to solve the problem. Like, Oh, what do I give my kid for snacks? Well, if they don't really need snacks as much, then that helps to solve the problem because you're getting more nutrient density in those meals um, potentially. Um, I mentioned here about dessert as well, because that can 
can be another challenge um, if you know the culture in the home is that like oh there's always you know some dessert that's sent with a school lunch um, or there's always a dessert after supper I mean that can get really challenging because yes there are healthier alternatives in my opinion for desserts but these are things that are either again going to be very expensive to be buying them pre-made and even in those healthier options they're not they're not perfectly healthy you can find you know a gluten-free dairy-free refined sugar-free you know ice cream for example at the store made of you know say coconut milk or something like that sweetened with you know, maybe like agave syrup or, or something like that um, but is it really like the healthiest thing maybe not the healthiest thing maybe it's you know a healthier alternative for some people but maybe still not the healthiest option so um, one of the things just to consider is, you know, what is that culture um, as far as dessert goes? And it can be tricky when there's already a sort of dessert culture in place trying to, you know, taking things away is is, is challenging when it's like, oh, we want to take this really good thing away. Um, but maybe looking at sort of a transition period of like, well, maybe let's use, you know, work with some healthier dessert options. I know in our household, you know, my wife and I just, we joke about it semi-regularly where the kids are like, you know, can we please have, you know, like two, you know, home made muffins you know for for dessert and it's like okay fine you know you guys have been you know it's like sure we'll let you do it not all the time but this time and then we look at the ingredient list and it's like you know there's bananas in there there's almond flour in there there's you know some eggs in there um you know and then we usually can get away with you know it, it, around half if not even less of like the called for sweetener which is typically um, honey or pure maple syrup and it's like it's really not an unhealthy thing um, so they're they're getting a, a healthy dessert they're really excited about it and you know they're they're not actually getting something that's you know objectively bad for them um, or unhealthy for them so um, phasing into like you know healthier options over time could be an, something to think about or uh, you know maybe um, kind of modifying that culture around the, the dessert where it's like well we don't have to have dessert say every meal maybe it's like we you know we're going to do this you know every other every other day or something like that so uh, what are some options for snacks so there's good old fruit uh, whether that's you know just fresh fruit or um, uh, frozen fruit or uh, say dried fruit so fruits uh, typically a pretty fan favorite um, the aforementioned uh, muffins or bars can be an option for snacks um, in our households you know when we're traveling or just you know maybe a couple times a week the kids will get some extra rice crackers or tortilla chips um, and then they could just have more of lunch or dinner so you know favorite thing we'll do is you know it's like oh they have their you know post supper muffin or whatever it happens to be um, and then like I'm still hungry like can I have another muffin it's like well how about you have another serving of you know have another quarter serving of your supper and then let's see if you're still hungry and then that's I'm sure any parents listening or like nodding their head like yes yes that is a litmus test it's a, a, a tried and true litmus test of like is the child actually hungry because uh, you don't want to deprive your child of food but you know of course once you start eating the sweeter stuff then it's a lot easier to uh, you know the, the taste buds are like oh another muffin sounds great another you know healthy cookie sounds great whereas like oh, I don't really want more pork chop okay I guess you're not actually hungry And then drinks. Uh, this is another one uh, where not going to be anything earth shattering here, but uh, water is a good option. Uh, that's probably the best thing for most of us to be drinking. Um, <clears throat> pure fruit juice, uh, as I think I alluded to earlier, it's something that can certainly be um, consumed for kids. I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's an unhealthy thing for kids if used sort of in moderation at appropriate times. Um, just a little note here to be cautious if something's labeled, you know, a fruit drink or fruit punch, or if it says a low sugar um, on the label. Um, just I think reading labels is a really good idea. Um, you know, as a very very general rule. Um, I think eyebrows should be raised a little bit if you're reading a label and you can't pronounce one of the ingredients or you don't know what one of the ingredients is uh, if you don't know what it is or it's unpronounceable it might not be the healthiest thing that's not a hard and fast rule but just kind of a general rule to think of um, if it says fruit punch or fruit drink um, I mean there are fruit punches that are 100 percent pure juice but um, it is just kind of a, a a tricky word out there it's like oh it's a fruit punch fruit drink or like it's fruit it's liquid like oh it must be fine um, but it might be if you read the ingredient label it's like oh there's added sugar or you know, other things in there that you don't want to be in there fruit drink is typically slang for there's some fruit juice in there and then also a bunch of sugar um, and then low sugar I mean I remember one time at the grocery store I saw that there was this low sugar apple juice I was like well that's that's kind of weird and so you read the label and it's like yeah it's apple juice and then 
they add extra water and then they added some aspartame or sucralose, like some artificial sweetener. So just, um, you know, reading the label and just so that you can make, make sure you're making an informed decision about what you're consuming. Um, and then as it says here, just asking yourself, you know, when do I want to hop up my child on sugar? Um, so as I was saying earlier, it's like, Hey, if my kids are going to get juice, <clears throat> I know if we're giving them some supplements or, or medication or, you know, if they're fighting off a cold or something like that, we'll put it in juice or applesauce or whatnot. And um, it's like they're going to get that before they have outside time to go play because we don't want them bouncing around and creating a ruckus, you know, inside the house when they're all hopped up on sugar. So just, you know, not holding any illusions about like, what is juice? You're basically taking all the fiber and everything out of the fruit and then just giving the pure sugar out of the juice. So, or out of the fruit. So it is, uh, you know, uh, sugar in a bottle, which, which is, you know, uh, again, not a bad thing for kids, but just something to think about, you know, timing is everything. Um, and then just a thought, this isn't, um, something that every kid likes, but, um, just as an alternative to pop or soda, um, getting some carbonated water and then adding some juice to it can be quite tasty as a kind of a special drink for, um, you know, or a special drink for special occasions or whatnot. So spent quite a lot of time there talking about the diet side of things. Again, wanted to make my wonderful employee happy. And so hopefully that um, gave her something to chew on and hopefully everybody else listening something to chew on as well. No pun intended. Um, so the next topic here is um, outside time. So <clears throat> I think that um, in my opinion, kids having time outside is really important. Um, of course, in most schools, um, they're uh, probably all schools, I, I'd imagine at least in at least in here in Canada, North America, I'm sure in other parts of the world, um, there's always an outside time with, you know, recess, unless it's, you know, hurricane outside or something like that. Um, so kids are of course, uh, you know, getting outside time, you know, and, um, uh, when they're, when they're going to public school, um, but are they getting enough time outside? Um, and then also what are they doing outside? You know, if it's like, oh, they're outside and then they're, you know, reading comic books or playing on their phones or whatever it is that kids are doing, like, um, just making sure I think outside time is so important. And then these are the reasons I think it's important. So just asking the question, well, when my child is outside, are they actually doing things that are allowing them to work on some of these different, uh, uh, factors? So, uh, one is vision optimization. Um, to my understanding, there's some research, this isn't hard and fast and I'm, certainly not an optometrist or ophthalmologist, but to my understanding, there is some research literature indicating that if um, kids are uh, doing activities where they're like looking at things that are far off in the distance. So if they're say out on a, um, say like out on a, like a nature walk, like a forest walk or something like that, or they're in like a big grassy field and they're looking at things, you know, their friends who are playing, I don't capture the flag or something like across the field, like needing to look far away is an important thing or looking at things that, that are various distances away. Of course, in a say traditional classroom setting, it's like, well, there's a certain distance to the chalkboard or whatever they have in, in uh, classrooms nowadays. Um, and, um, and then, you know, distance from, you know, say their, their eye to the page on the desk in front of them or whatnot. But, um, you know, with a lot of us, you know, kids in a classroom or adults in a cubicle or whatnot, like we're not really, uh, putting our eyes to their full, uh, potential. And we're also generally looking straight ahead, not really needing to worry about our peripheral peripheral vision as much, um, say inside of a classroom or, you know, at, at work. So outside gives a lot of opportunities to, um, use our eyes to their fullest extent. And I, to my understanding, um, there is some correlation with more outside time and, um, it, like seeing using our eyes to their fuller potential outside and a reduced risk of myopia slash close nearsightedness, um, slash, you know, need for, for glasses. Um, sunlight is also very important. Uh, we need it for vitamin D. Uh, we need it for a lot of other things. Um, I had a great um, interview with uh, a woman named Carrie, uh, her handle is Carrie B Wellness um, for my Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast. Um, I think this was in 2023. I don't remember now. It was a while ago. Um, but uh, anyways, we had a great chat about like the myriad benefits of sunlight and it's not just about vitamin D. So outside time, important for that on at least non overcast days, although we get, you know, uh, beneficial UV rays, even when the, the cloud cover is up there. Um, outside time also facilitates natural movements. Um, so what I mean by that is we were designed, uh, our bodies were designed to go through a wide range of movements, you know, hanging upside down, climbing things, um, you know, doing somersaults, spinning around, like, um, you know, you see kids out at play and it's like, oh my gosh, there's just little monkeys out there. Um, and so outside time tends to facilitate that more than inside time. I mean, there are folks that are, you know, outside of the box, like, like my family, we have monkey bars inside of our house. Um, cause we, 
want our kids to be able to climb inside um, as well, but uh, or you know hang and things like that. But um, outside, of course, encourages more of that natural movement as well. Um, and then also grounding. Um, so. Uh, I believe that making contact with the earth is important um, on, I think, a number of levels, but um, even just from strictly a health perspective, I think having that direct contact with the earth is important. Um, and so whether that's, you know, kids playing outside barefoot, um, you know, in warmer weather or if they're, um, you know, in any weather, really, kids will find a way to make contact with the ground, whether it's, you know, crawling on their, you know, on their hands and knees and putting their hands directly on the ground or, you know, doing those somersaults, putting their heads on the ground or whatnot. Obviously, being careful for ticks and things like that in the grass, depending on where you live. Um, but uh, that contact with the earth, I think, is really important. Uh, next uh, quick topic here is chemical exposure mitigation. So I mentioned earlier on that uh, episode that was featured on both podcasts with Laura Adler, um, the environmental toxins nerd. So uh, please feel free to reference that. But the punchline from that um, interview was that um, chemicals are bad for us. They are not uh, regulated or controlled in the way you might think they would be. It's like, oh, if the government says it's okay to be in the uh, these, this or that product, it must be okay. They've done lots of safety studies. Uh, unfortunately, nothing could be further from the truth. And there's no malice in there. It's just there were no safeguards put in, in the first place. A lot of chemicals have been grandfathered in over the course of time. And it's just a big, it, it's a bit of a mess. Um, so uh, trying to minimize our exposure to chemical, uh, minimize or exposure to chemicals, I think is really important. Um, just a couple of um, tidbits there, but please reference that podcast episode if you want more, more detail or uh, follow Lara on uh, Instagram. She has post stuff all the time. She, she's great. Um, so trying to minimize uh, or, or ideally just outright avoid artificially scented products. So that could be hand soap, laundry detergent, fabric softener, uh, deodorants for you know older kids, um, perfume, which could be older kids or um, just not wearing perfume or cologne or things like that are ourselves as their parents, um, because all of these things contain uh, toxic chemicals that are not good for us. Um, the unscented products are a good option or um, potentially things that are scented with say like essential oils or whatnot um, could be an option that's healthier. Um, minimizing exposure to plastics um, is also something to consider. So uh, that would be in particular, like the biggest no-no is heating up food in plastic, but then even trying to minimize say plastic food containers, uh, water bottles, like ideally using metal water, water bottles, or at the very least getting the water bottles that are BPA free. And there's other uh, chemicals now that some water bottles will say we're free of, you know, this or that other acronym as well. Um, and then uh, trying to minimize pesticide exposure. So that would be kind of circling back to the organic food if possible, or trying to at least choose like the lowest spray foods uh, possible and that, you know, uh, avoiding the dirty dozen the dirty dozen list as best as one can. Um, and then also minimizing pesticide exposure in say your lawn, you know, um, preferably not using any pesticides at all um, on one's property um, for various reasons. My very first episode of the um, over the Optimistic Future podcast was an interview um, about uh, No Mo May, which is um, basically this uh, campaign that's been kind of going around for years now saying like, you know, don't mow your lawn in the month of May. Don't do any yard work in the month of May because it um, inadvertently destroys the habitat of pollinators that aren't quite ready to come out of hibernation yet. Um, but uh, tied in with that as well would be, you know, trying to minimize pesticide use because we don't want to, you know, kill those critters that are so important for the survival of us and our planet. You know, we don't want to be, you know, using pesticides to kill the bees and kill the butterflies, et cetera, because they're obviously really crucial. If you've ever seen the bee movie, you know, uh, it's you know, really not good to uh, kill off bees and other pollinators. And uh, then one of the things that Lara had mentioned during our interview um, which um, I just don't really ever think of because I, I don't know anyone who wears shoes in their home, but I understand some people do wear shoes in their home. And so when we are wear, wearing shoes in our home, then that's going to bring in the chemicals and toxins and whatnot from outside. So uh, if we're walking on the road where there's, you know, tire rubber and, you know, exhaust and all these different things, you know, we just don't want to be tracking those chemicals throughout our home. So just ideally taking shoes off when we come into our homes. So a note here about movement. Um, so movement for kids, really important, really important for adults as well. Um, 
ultimately any movement is good movement. So, you know, it's like, you know, my kid just likes riding their bike and that's all they do. It's like, you know what? That's great. Heck of a lot better than sitting on a couch and not moving. Um, or my kid, you know, just likes going for walks. I mean, I don't know many kids who just like going for walks, but if they're out there, like, great, you know, it's, it's, it's good to do that. Um, but ideally there'd be a variety of movement. Um, <clears throat> as I say here on the slide, you know, think full range of motion. So thinking like, okay, it's great if kids can, um, jump and climb and tumble and, you know, run and, um, you know, bike and swim and, you know, as much different movement as possible, I think is really, really good. I think it helps to um, optimize our lymphatic system uh, flow in our bodies. I think it helps to strengthen our various joints and you know, keep our mobility up. It's obviously good for our cardiovascular systems, um, really encourages that growth hormone to be working as well as possible so kids can reach their uh, sort of physiological, you know, full physiological potential as best they can. So uh, movement is, is wonderful. <clears throat> and so just kind of, you know, I know as parents, we have so much going on, you know, many of us are very, very busy, uh, just maybe taking a moment to think like, well, what kind of movement does my kid do during the day? And it's like, you know what, they don't really ever hang upside down. They don't really ever, you know, climb things, um, or they don't, you know, really do somersaults or, or this or that, or, um, you know, like, oh yeah, I don't know if my kid really knows how to, you know, throw a ball, you know, overhand well, or something like that. Just thinking about, um, some of these movements that if they aren't getting a really, really full palette of movements, just think about, okay, well, what can we sort of work on here? Um, so that's just some, some food for thought there. So again, any movement is good movement, um, but just thinking if there might be any sort of a key area that might be uh, not being utilized, then that's something to think about. Um, and then just a little reminder here, this is more getting into my own, uh, I don't want to say personal philosophies. It's not like I made this up, but um, I don't know how widely accepted this is, but um, so just a little remi remi <clears throat> reminder that uh, little humans are little mammals. That's that's not controversial. We we all know we're mammals, and humans are little little versions. Of, you know, the, the kids are uh, um, are little, of course. Um, um, but just what I'm kind of emphasizing here, or what I'm wanting to bring up there, is that um, mammals in general. When you look at you know cute little videos on social media or wherever, you know little mammals like oftentimes they're tumbling. You know, they're they're roughhousing a bit, they're wrestling a little bit, um, and that's something that I, I've heard some compelling um, uh, opinions, um, which basically just talking about how if kids don't have sort of access to that sort of more like, um, I don't quite want to say rough and tumble play because rough can sort of have a negative connotation to it. But if they don't sort of have um, uh, access to that sort of like, you know, um, horsing around sort of play, then um, it might be something that's actually developmentally detrimental to not have access to that. And again, I'm, this is not an area that I specialize in. This is just something that I've um, incorporated into my own parenting philosophy. I'm just listening to other folks who do know about these things uh, more than I do. And um, I, I think it is just something to consider. So I, I had, there's one uh, family that I knew and they, you know, really didn't um, do any kind of, you know, wrestling or, or whatnot with their, their little guy. And then um, that little guy um, hung out with my boys who do nothing but wrestle. Basically they do lots of other things, but they, they love wrestling with each other, with me, their older brother, my, my two younger ones are six and eight. Um, and they've been, as soon as they were big enough to rough house, they were, they were doing it. Um, and so this, uh, little guy spent some time with my kids and they had the best time, you know, rough housing a bit. And then I kind of got in on it. And anyways, after that, like the parents saw like, Oh my gosh, like he loves this. Like he was started asking for it and they're like, okay, we're going to start doing this. And then now, now they do it on a regular basis and he loves it. And you know, who knows, maybe that will have zero impact whatsoever on his life one way or the other. Um, or maybe it's a really good thing. When we do rough house, there are so many, you know, nerve endings that are, uh, stimulated. Um, we, uh, you know, work on our, uh, our balance and our proprioception and all these different things. I had a wonderful interview with um, a woman named Rachel Harrington. She, her Instagram handle is um, uh, Sensational Brain. That's her company. Of, she has a company of the same name. We talked all about something called um, primitive reflexes and sensory integration issues. It was um, on both uh, podcast platforms. If I didn't mention that, or both podcasts uh, featured this interview, um, and 
when I've, you know, I've been following her for quite a while and her and others who talk about um, when kids do have these kind of nervous system processing challenges, um, the, the therapy for that um, is doing different exercises and whatnot, but a lot of them have to do with, you know, just um, certain movements and, and being, you know, sort of touched in certain areas, like along, say, the length of the spine to like kind of stimulate the spinal nerves and whatnot. And it's like, that's all stuff that just happens naturally with, you know, more, you know, quote unquote, rough and tumble play. Um, so I just think about that and say, hmm, you know, every other mammal does that, like all the little baby mammals and you know, cute little bears and dogs and cats and whatever, they all do it. Um, and I think our kids need to do it too. Um, and then just, again, all very anecdotal here, but um, my kids and I have been doing jujitsu for quite a while. Jujitsu, if you're not familiar, it's kind of like wrestling combined with judo. It's kind of like a, it's a grappling sport. Um, and I, um, you know, help to, uh, teach some, like I assist, uh, assistant instruct, uh, or one of the, the helpers at the classes sometimes. And I'm always watching my kids, even if I'm not helping out with the classes, as I just love watching them in action and all that. And, um, like there's just, you know, kids of every, you know, shape, size, you know, uh, gender, ethnicity, like it's just, um, such a, such a, like a, 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 a mix of like, you know, every kid of every walk in life you can think of. And like they, you know, not every kid in the world goes to jujitsu class, but just the fact that like, oh, the kids just really seem to love it. Um, and, and I think it's, um, anyways, maybe built into our DNA or something like that, but, um, just yeah, little plug for, um, that quote unquote rough and tumble play. Um, <clears throat> question mark here saying a bear or says barefoot is best question mark. Um, I think that there's a very strong case to be made that trying to be barefoot as much as we can, or using uh, what they call minimalist shoes, which, um, enable us to kind of have our cake and eat it too. And that we're, you know, not barefoot when it's, you know, snowy outside or we're walking on rocks, like sharp rocks or something like that. Um, but these minimalist shoes, which allow our feet to kind of try to maintain their, um, normal biomechanics while still wearing a shoe, um, I think in my opinion is, is best. So either being barefoot if we can, or if not barefoot using minimalist shoes that still encourage the natural biomechanics of our feet, I think is really important for a lot of reasons. Um, there's a wonderful, brilliant, uh, woman named Katie Bowman. Um, she's written many books, uh, one of which is called, um, whole body barefoot. Um, she is on my bucket list to have as an, a person to be interviewed. Uh, just, uh, haven't uh, reached out to her yet because, um, I, yeah, just, I, I don't know that my podcast is popular enough to warrant a, a guest of her a caliber, but I, uh, we'll, we'll see anyways, uh, a little bit of, you know, I'll be a little starstruck because my wife and I have been following her for a long time and she, anyways, uh, her and, and others, um, but her book, so she's a, a, has, I believe a PhD in human biomechanics and, uh, her book, whole body barefoot really changed, uh, I'll say changed my life, changed my wife's life as well. Um, and that it really, um, uh, drew a lot of attention or attention to how important foot biomechanics are, um, not just for the health of our feet, but I would argue every other joint in the body, uh, especially ankles, knees, hips, low backs, you know, as I say to my patients all the time, you know, how many people do you know above the age of 60, even 50 who, you know, don't have some complaint about one of those joints. And it's like, it's hard to find someone who doesn't have some concern there. And I think a lot of it has to do with um, biomechanical issues with our feet. So um, anyways, I kind of mentioned it earlier with the outside time and, you know, getting the grounding, but I think barefoot for our kids is great. And, um, and anyways, question mark there, cause again, not a, I'm not an expert in human uh, like foot biomechanics, but I think it is just something to have on one's radar. So um, yeah, so Kitty Bowman is uh, one resource. Um, there's another group called the Foot Collective, uh, which they have an Instagram page. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, those would be places to consider getting started. And then uh, last point here on the slide says optimal daily dose of chair usage. So that's a weird bullet point to have. So what do I mean there? Um, what I mean is that to my understanding, um, sitting in chairs is not very good for us. Um, when we sit in chairs, it allows or it um, uh, it makes our lower body muscles weaker because we're not um, engaging them. So if you're not, you know, using it, you're, you know, at least not 
gaining there and maybe losing it a little bit. Um, and then to my understanding, it also can impair the flow of our lymphatics, getting fluid from our lower bodies back up to our circulatory system. And that's something that might impair our detoxification function, could potentially, and I, I don't know for sure, again, this is not an area that I'm an expert in, but I've heard uh, smart people who are experts in these areas talk about it and cite research and whatnot. So I, I think there's something to it, which is why I'm mentioning it here. Um, but uh, that that could you know potentially exacerbate things like you know varicose veins um, and could potentially exacerbate things um, like you know different musculoskeletal disorders from from the waist down. Maybe have some negative impact on our overall lymphatic system function and maybe impact our detoxification and whatnot. So um, I, I'm personally very mindful about how much time um, I spend in a chair. I use a standing desk whenever I'm doing phone consultations or video consultations. Um, you know my wife and kids and I we you know cut the legs off of our dinner table. Uh, we, we sit on the floor while we eat. We try to sit on the floor as much as we can. And uh, just a little personal anecdote, um, when my oldest, uh, who's again, uh, almost 18, um, when he was little, um, I just, you know, and I was uh, 18 years younger than I am now in my early forties now, um, I just hated being down on the floor. You know, I love them to pieces, still do, uh, played with them all the time, but I was like, oh man, like just playing on the floor, like, let's play at the table. Like it just, it was uncomfortable sitting down there. It was like, uncomfortable getting up. Um, and I was a pretty fit guy, you know, playing ultimate Frisbee and lifting weights and all these things. I wasn't, you know, like a, an unhealthy individual. Um, but then once we started sitting on the floor all the time, which we probably started doing maybe 10 years ago now, um, it, you know, there was a transition period of maybe a couple of months where I was like, Oh, this is kind of uncomfortable. And then now it's like no problem at all. Like my, um, core muscles are stronger. My quad muscles are stronger, just getting used to getting up and down off the floor. Um, so, just uh, thinking about chair usage. So how does this translate into kids? Well, of course, in you know traditional classroom setting, they're sitting in a chair. Um, so just thinking about like, oh, if we're gonna do, you know, say we're gonna play a board game, you know, in the evening, um, well, maybe play that board game on the floor, um, which is maybe good for the kids, good for the adults as well to practice some non-chair time as well. So that's what I'm referring to there. Ran on the bend here, a couple more topics. So topic of screen time. So the first bullet point says, yikes, because um, anyone who's got kids that are probably, you know, at least, you know, anywhere between say eight to 18 years old, it's like, oh my gosh, um, screen time is, is quite the thing, whether it's, you know, TV time, uh, phone time, having a phone, because all the other kids have a phone at school, like it, it's quite the thing. So um, I have no, uh, I have no wonderful wisdom here. And I'm like, oh, this is the solution to screen time, um, but I'm going to to, I just wanted to include this here in a couple of thoughts. So as it says here, uh, probably best to keep this to a minimum. Um, but, uh, and, and I say, I say that because, um, oops, that easy. Okay. I think we're, I think we're good. I tried to remove my last bullet point, but I to just go back cause I wasn't quite ready for this current one, but it made a weird sound. I'm just going to not push any more buttons so I don't uh, ruin this recording somehow. Um, the reason I think it's probably best to keep screen time to a minimum, um, is especially when it comes to, you know, um, social media um, interaction with kids is I've um, heard some compelling uh, information from, again, experts in this area. Actually, this is um, a topic that I'm looking in the process of finding uh, someone to interview for the um, uh, Optimistic Future podcast on actually just to get you know, to flesh out my knowledge around this. I want to talk to an actual expert in this, but to my understanding, there's some compelling evidence to suggest that um, kids spending you know more times on screens, especially you know, social media, it can be just really bad for their mental health, their attention spans, that kind of thing. So I, I think it's probably best to keep it to a minimum, but if screens are going to be used, I think, you know, as it says here, trying to minimize social media use for as long as possible is probably best. I know that can be very, very challenging, but just wanted to put it on the slide. So it's at least on uh, folks' radars, but I, I have no magical ideas as to how to make that easy and not turn it into a big fight. Um, then the other thing here, just maybe food for thought is that if kids are going to be say having screen time you know playing video games um in my opinion i think that you know creative and or cooperative games are probably best like um i'm uh, sure any parents uh, listening here have probably heard of the the juggernaut that is uh, the game minecraft it's been around for many years uh, one of my kids just did a little presentation on it um, apparently it was sold several years ago to i think maybe microsoft for like you know 2.5 billion dollars like just it's such a it's just insane how popular this game is um but you know, looking at, you know, what I rather that my kid was playing, say, you know, Call of Duty or some other shooting game versus Minecraft, like definitely Minecraft because they can play with their friends, build things together. I mean, there is 
you know, it can be a fighting aspect with uh, Minecraft with, you know, swords and bows and arrows and things, but, um, you know, they're, they're building things, you know, they're being quite creative. Um, there's different cooperative games. So I, I don't think screen time and video games are, you know, the end of the world, but, um, yeah, just, it, it's, it's a challenging topic, but just something to have on, have on our radars. And the very last topic here is uh, something called attachment parenting. I, I kind of debated whether or not to put this um, in the presentation because um, as I keep on saying, like, I'm not an expert in this, I'm not an expert in that, and I'm, I am an expert in some things, um, but not not in uh, attachment parenting. Um, but I, did, I decided to put this in here again just for um, information's sake because um, this is something that, uh, again, my wife and I, we started using this method with our kids, um, yeah, again, probably around 10 years ago. And it's something that um, I think has been uh, really, really good for our family. It works really well for my wife and I, works really well with our philosophy and just where we have had the chance to, you know, now having done attachment parenting with our oldest for the last 10 years. So since he was about eight, now just about 18, um, it, it's um, proven to be really, um, a really good fit for us. Um, you know, I'm very thankful um, every day. Thankful that I have a really good relationship um, with my oldest. Uh, you know, get it, did this through his, uh, you know, through the teenage years. Um, you know, did this through like you know, like the the preteen years, the teenage years. Now, like the just on the verge of being, you know, a, a, at least in the eyes of the law, you know, a, a legal adult. Um, it's something that's been a, a really good fit um, and I'm really thankful that we kind of follow this approach because, um, you know, when there have been, you know, various challenges as anyone listening who has or has had teenagers will know, like, goodness gracious, you know, um, it's, it can be, it can, there can be challenges there, um, kind of f uh, sort of adhering to these principles um, has been, or sorry, it sounds, that sounds more dogmatic than I meant it. I'm um, sort of having some of these like kind of guiding principles to, you know, when we're making, when my wife and I have been making decisions or have made decisions for our kids, it's been really, really helpful. So I just mentioned here at the top of the slide that, um, again, like this podcast episode is sponsored by Instagram because I'm giving everybody's Instagram um, handles, but that's where a lot of people, you can find their information. Um, so there's this uh, woman, um, her name's Ellie. Oh my gosh. I can't remember her a lot. I think it might be Ellie Hartman. Shoot. I can't remember now. Anyways, her handle is the attachment nerd because she is an attachment parenting uh, expert. I think, I think she's a psychologist or, or something like that. Um, but uh, anyways, she, her handle is the attachment nerd because she nerds out on attachment parenting. It's a really, really great resource. Um, she has you know, she's one of these uh, Instagram accounts where every single post of hers I read, I'm like, I just want to, you know, post this to my, oh, shoot, I can't remember the, uh, to my story, I think is the, the right uh, jargon there. So like, I just want everybody to know about the attachment nerd because I, I think her parenting advice is so, so, so useful. So anyway, she's a really great resource. There's others out there as well. At, um, but um, as far as the attachment parenting goes, and again, I'm not an attachment parenting expert, certainly not giving any parenting advice, just speaking to what's been helpful in my family. And some of the things I have listed here with the top priorities, I don't know if these all officially fit under the umbrella of attachment parenting, but I'm just including them here again, because I just wanted to share my, um, yeah, my, my thoughts on this. So on um, the top priorities um, around attachment parenting or, or analogous philosophy, shall we say, is that kids should have as much access to their parents as possible. Now, you know, that's going to vary from household to household, you know, if, uh, you know, you're listening to this, you know, you're a single parent, you know, working three jobs and you don't really get much face time with your kids, you know, like that's, that's a very different situation than, you know, in my household where my wife is home with the kids, you know, homeschooling them. And, you know, I, work for myself and I can alter my hours and, you know, book extra days off here and there to spend more time with my kids. And I'm always home for supper and this and that. So, you know, there, there's a spectrum there, of course. Um, so that's why I say, you know, as much access as possible, or maybe I should have said as much access as reasonably possible. But uh, one of the principles of attachment parenting, to my understanding is again, the kids have access, whether they're going to capitalize on that access is a question mark. And I, again, I can say where I've, you know, had, raised a child now up until almost, almost 18, um, the, the amount of access that the kids want really varies a lot, um, from, from day to day. Um, <clears throat> so where, you know, my little sweet little six year old, um, and eight year old, they would just spend all day, every day with me if given the opportunity. Um, but, but I just kind of say that, okay, I could re revise that. Um, we really capitalize on our time together, but say on, you know, if I'm home on vacation or something like that, and we have, you know, a whole week together, it's like, yeah, it's like, oh, dad, 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 dad time. But then they'll, you know, after say we're hung up for the morning, it's like, okay, kids, you know, um, you know, I'm going to, 
whatever, like work on this. Like, do you guys want some alone, you know, some of your own free time for play? It's like, like, yeah, for sure. And then they'll go play, you know, Lego for an hour or something like that. And then they're ready for more dad time. Um, whereas, you know, my now 18 year old, um, you know, there's, we'll, we'll spend time together and every once in a while, you know, we'll just start chatting and it's like, Oh my gosh, like this kid's been talking to me for the last two hours and I'm just soaking it all up. Cause again, anyone who has a, a child in that range or who had a child in that range and is now older, it's like, yeah, you just you cherish that time when they're in their older teens. Cause they usually don't want that much time with you. Um, but it's like it, it this attachment parenting philosophy, I'm still, you know, I'm still using that with, with the oldest one. Cause it's like, okay, if, if, you know, unless I have to run to work or something, you know, it's like, okay, if he wants to talk my, talk to me until, you know, 11 o'clock at night, cause he's got stuff on his mind, I, I'm there for him. Um, or if he, you know, wants to talk for 10 minutes, it's like, okay, he's going to be the top priority. If I'm like, okay, the kids are Skyping with my mom who lives in Ontario and she's reading to them over Skype. Okay, wonderful. I've, I've got my like hour and a half on Sunday afternoon to, you know, actually get caught up on some stuff, get caught up on some emails. Um, and then if my oldest, you know, comes into the room and he's like, Oh dad, like I want to pick your brain about, you know, he's wants to, he's doing a carpentry apprenticeship. So he wants to talk to me about that and, or some logistical thing or his taxes or something. It's like, yep, I'm just, I'm just there. You know, it's like, that's, um, it, it's just like this default mode in my mind where it's like, okay, if, if it's within my power, um, nobody's going to be, you know, killed or maimed. Um, I'm going to, you know, just kids, are, I'm going to give them the attention that they need, you know, when they need it sort of thing. So, um, anyways, again, going to be different for different, uh, family situations, et cetera, et cetera. But just again, kind of having it like, as, as I phrased it earlier, kind of like a, a bit of a guiding principle of like, okay, my kids need access to me. Um, I'm going to within reason, like, you know, give them the access to me or, uh, they're going to have as much access to me as possible in terms of what they need. And then when they have that access uh, to my understanding, you know, again, listening to the attachment nerd and others, um, then like, there's just this balance. Um, I think there's this fear and I think I, I believe it's unfounded. I mean, I, I understand where it's coming from. Um, but I, I believe that it's unfounded and I'm again, not a, um, I'm not an expert in this area, so I could be certainly wrong with this, but I've, I've kind of heard the fear before or this concern before of like, well, if I give my kid, you know, like too much access to me, then they're just going to want more and more. And like, I, I gotta, you know, I gotta live my life too. I gotta do this and that. I need, you know, some time to myself or whatever. What I can say from experience is that the amount of attention or, or access that kids want, it does, it does really vary quite a bit. Um, and I think that if we give kids the access that they are, if, if kids have access when they want it, then there's going to sort of be this balance where again, there's some days where my two youngest, like they're just happy to go play and they they're doing their thing. And my wife and I are like, really? Like we, we just get to kind of hang out where one of us isn't on kid duty. Like this, this is amazing. Um, and then other days where they, they, they want us all the time. So, so I, I think that the concern that like, Oh, if I, my kid has too much access to me, they won't learn how to, you know, not need access to me. I, I believe that to my understanding, that's not a well-founded concern. And it's something that if we give kids access when they need it and want it, then they're going to figure out how to regulate how much access they actually need um, to us. And, and to my understanding that helps with self-esteem and developing and other relationships, you know, might help to minimize the risk of, you know, becoming overly dependent on another person or anyways, again, this is not my area of expertise, but check out the attachment nerd and, um, see what, see what you think, um, or, or some analogous, uh, uh, expert in this. But, um, anyways, that's, that's one of the, um, the, the, the top priorities. Uh, another top priority here is something called, uh, the, uh, um, referred to as natural consequences versus punishing kids. Um, so what that basically means is that, okay, um, say a child, I don't know, keeps, um, you know, leaving their bike up front, you know, they don't, they keep forgetting to put their bike away and like, you got to put your bike away. Like we don't want to get stolen or, or whatnot. Um, and so they just keep forgetting about a bike up front, keep forgetting up front. Well, you know, you could, as a parent, like we could just straight up punish them and say like, well, you know, um, okay, you don't get as much screen time. You have to go to bed early, like whatever it is, like it could be, you know, more of like a, just more of like a arbitrary, like, you know, you know, punitive, um, course of action. Um, or it could be like, okay, you know, you keep forgetting your bike up front. We're really worried it's going to get stolen. Um, what we're going to do is we're actually going to take your bike away for, you know, 
two days. Um, and then you're going to see what it feels like for it to be stolen because this is what we're worried about. And if it gets stolen, you know, we don't have the money to buy another one right away, or we don't want you to have to spend all of your, you know, savings, you know, on a new bike. So let's, you know, we're going to put this away for a couple of days and then see, and then you can see what that's like. And then let's see if you can take better care of your bike. Cause then you'll know what it'd be like to have it stolen. Um, and then, you know, kind of see how that goes and maybe the kid you know does well for a couple of weeks and then they forget it outside again like, okay you know you left it outside again we're going to take it away for you know three days um and then let's see how it goes um so just where you know one could devil's advocate is like well you're still punishing them it's like yeah it's you know a natural consequence still isn't any fun i mean our oldest when you know we again incorporated this 10 years ago he's like you're still punishing me and it's like no i understand you don't like this but like this is a natural consequence like this is it's 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 an important difference it's not just semantics um but what we found um like my wife and i have found is that that was a much more effective approach to take than you know just kind of a more like okay you're getting a timeout you know it's like you're just sitting in a corner Corner. You can still certainly use timeouts. This doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing, but just thinking about the natural consequence approach, um, something that's been quite successful uh, for us. We've been really happy with it in our house. Um, another component of attachment parenting, to my understanding, is um, kind of this guide, again, kind of guiding principle is preserve the relationship as a top priority. Um, so this is something that I think applies at all ages, but um, it, I think there's a greater, um, uh, a more, more obvious application, like as kids are, are getting older. So like an example around that would be, um, you know, so if, you, if as parents, we say to our kids, you know what, like you can tell me anything, you know, if you have a problem, like, you know, let me know, you know, what's happening. And, uh, you know, like I, I'm, I'm here for you. You can tell me anything. You can always come to me with anything. Um, and then if the child, you know, you know, comes forward and, you know, says, okay, I, you know, I, I started smoking or I, um, I don't know, um, you know, I stole 50 bucks from somebody or I, I don't know, they come forward to you with something, you know, that's really tough as a parent. Cause on the one hand you're like, okay, I'm really glad they came to me and told me about this, but then that's also not okay. And like, <laughs> depending on the circumstance, like our knee jerk reaction is like, you must be punished. This is terrible. I taught you better than this. Um, and so with, with attachment parenting, again, I'm not saying any of this is easy. Um, and I'm, again, not an attachment parenting coach, but, um, to my understanding, like an approach in that, um, using an attachment parenting approach would be okay. Top priority is preserving the relationship. You know, I'm, I'm really glad you told me about this. You know, as I said before, I told you many times, you can come to me with anything, you know, let's figure this out. You know, like why, why are you smoking? Like, you know, why did you take the money like this and that? Um, because if the next step is like, I'm glad you told me, but like now you're grounded for the next month, you know, it's kind of like, ah, oh, geez, like that's, the the message to the kid is gonna like ah maybe I can't tell mom or dad or or caregiver about everything because then I'm gonna get grounded for a month, um so it is a tricky thing to balance and you know devil's advocate to that would be like well yeah if you're not gonna punish them they're just gonna do it again and it, and again it's a tricky balance but um, again where we need to make our choices as parents you know what type of approach are we gonna take uh, what type of approach are we going to use um, again the attachment parenting has just been uh, hands down the best approach for our family. And um, again, looking at resources, like say from the attachment nerd or others kind of getting a bit of, or there's, you know, attachment parenting coaches out there, you know, psychologists like, like uh, Ellie from the, the attachment nerd, you know, offering these different services. It's not something that we just have to like, Oh, read like an inspirational Instagram post and then just, you know, kind of like figure it out, you know, yourself from there, there, there can be, a, there are additional resources there, you know, eBooks, this type of thing. But um, that's just a, an example of um, another, I think to my understanding, core principle of attachment parenting. Um, the very last thing here is uh, to, as it says here, work on your own quote unquote stuff so your kids don't have to. Um, this is a tricky one. Um, this can you know stir up a lot of things and this also doesn't have to be an all or nothing overnight change that has to be made. Um, but what, what I can say from personal experience is that um, there's been, there were you know, a number of times, um, you know, it's, again, this is, well, actually this is something that comes up with younger kids as well as, um, you know, say, preteens and teens and, and older teens. Um, but uh, things that will, um, you know, make a parent mad or um, get really upset or really trigger them um, about something their kid's doing, <clears throat> um, again, speaking from personal experience and then also just seeing things by proxy, reflecting on my own childhood, looking at examples on, you know, Instagram posts from uh, the attachment nerd and others. Um, <clears throat> I'll, 
in many cases, um, the things that really trigger us the most about our kids have a lot to do with, you know, how we were raised or baggage that we have or, um, you know, um, preconceived notions about things that, you know, may be related to that topic, for example. Um, and basically by kind of working on ourselves, um, by, you know, kind of processing or, um, you know, integrating some of the, you know, traumas from our, our childhood or, you know, challenging factors from our childhood or, um, you know, other, other stages of life or whatnot, um, kind of basically, as it says here, working on our own stuff, um, by doing that, then, um, and if I'm paraphrasing here, um, but my uh, take home message from, uh, I believe some attachment nerd, um, you know, content and maybe from some others is that if we work on our own stuff, then our kids don't have to do it for us. And that can be like a really, really tough thing to hear and a tough big pill to swallow. Um, but as I've, you know, been looking at attachment parenting for quite a while, reading about this, doing this ourselves, my wife and I in the trenches, um, so many times it comes down to like, oh darn, I think that's actually true. And as much as it's easier to be like, ah, oh, my kid just needs to stop doing this. They need to stop driving me nuts. You know, I need to punish them, this and that. It's like, in a lot of cases, it's like, ah, oh, okay. Um, maybe 20% of it is like my kids just being a rapscallion and, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe needs to be punished. Um, but a lot of it is like, ah, this is actually kind of a big reflection of what's going on in me. Um, a transgenerational thing, um, you know, uh, um, you know, in, in, within my, within a person's family, um, you know, so, uh, anyways, it, it's, um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Cause, um, again, not my, my area of expertise, but this is just another component of attachment parenting. So if you're listening to this, um, content from this slide, which I see here has been going on for about 16 minutes here. Um, then I think looking into attachment parenting further, if it's something you're not already familiar with, is something worth looking at. Um, again, I just can't say enough good things about it. And I, I'm a very open-minded individual. Um, I'm constantly learning new things for my clinical practice. And my wife and I are, you know, um, always, always learning new things, looking into new things, you know, seeing parenting advice stuff coming up and whatnot. And if there's a better system that comes up, um, we will, we will happily jump ship, but I just haven't seen anything better. Uh, uh, there's been nothing that's a better fit than the attachment parenting model for our family. So that is why I have this slide here. Um, yes, and there are other things. So there's an et cetera there as well. This is not, uh, everything, um, that attachment parenting, um, embodies, but to my, my take home messages, these are the main things. All right. Last slide. We're all done. Um, I hope that this podcast episode was of interest. Um, I hope that, um, yeah, if you made it this far, you gained something from listening to all of this. Um, again, I think raising our kids, um, it's, it's our you know greatest responsibility as parents, uh, greatest joy as parents. Um, and yeah, just, um, the, every, uh, we want to do everything that we can for our kids. So these are, uh, some of the, you know, I think the most important things that, um, I can think of that's been helpful for me raising my kids. So, um, if you, um, are listening to this or, or if you're, well, if you're watching this, um, on YouTube, um, please consider leaving a comment. If you have any, um, sort of feedback, um, on this podcast episode, or if there's something that you found to be really helpful, uh, in, in terms of raising your own kids or, or some other resource like, Oh yeah, like, you know, I don't know the attachment nerd, but you know, this other person is really, really great. Like, please, uh, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section, or if you're, um, you know, seeing the, an Instagram post or something on this, like a little clip or whatnot, please, you know, leave in the comment section there. Um, so I'd be curious to hear, uh, uh, feedback on this. And, um, and then, yeah, just as it says on the slide here, um, my podcasts are an optimistic future podcast and the overcoming chronic illness podcast. Um, and then just a few websites here. So I do run, uh, well, I have an employee who runs a couple of uh, websites for me, madelocalgroup.com and madelocalgroup.ca. Um, those are both um, not-for-profit uh, websites. They're actually affiliated with a registered charity here in uh, Canada called the Made Local Group Charity. Um, and uh, we're raising money with that charity to uh, basically combat child poverty in Canada, um, eventually uh, branch that out to other countries as well. Probably the U S would be next and then maybe other places from there. Um, so basically these websites are, um, uh, searchable databases of companies who make products like actually manufacture products in Canada, um, which is at the .ca site. And then also in the U S which is the .com version of course. Um, and so the, again, these companies actually make products in our respective countries. 
um, which I think is really important because when we're actually making uh, products locally, it's something that's really good for the local economy. It creates more jobs. Um, it's also something that, um, in my opinion and to my understanding, is good for the environment um, because we're not shipping things, you know, say, all the, you know, from overseas or whatnot. Um, and then it's also something that bolsters our um, our entrepreneurs, our middle class. Um, you know, I think that I, I have um, concerns about the division of wealth that I believe, to my understanding, is just getting worse and worse. I'm planning to eventually have a podcast episode about that at some point. Uh, lots, lots of ideas for podcast episodes. Um, and so I think that by trying to strengthen the middle class, you know, I'd, I'd much rather, you know, buy a product from a company that's making something, you know, here in Canada than, you know, another company that already has, you know, trillions of dollars, well, maybe not trillions, but, you know, millions or billions of dollars. Um, and it's like, do they really need more money? Um, and can I support a local company that, you know, definitely could use uh, more more money so when it, when it says made local it's really you know more like made made national you know made in canada made in made in the usa um but uh, th that's where those um, sites are for and eventually i plan to um uh, branch out to other countries as well but it's only so many hours in the day um the last website url here is uh, optimisticfuturepodcast.com so if you haven't checked it out already um, please consider visiting the site um, there's a list of simple steps that one can incorporate um, to help make the world a better place to um, work on um, environmental or economic or societal challenges that we're having. Um, I mean, I'm going to be a little hard pressed to find simple steps in this podcast episode um, because some of these things like attachment parenting, oh my gosh, that's not a simple step. And of course, you know, not something everyone would be interested in. Um, but uh, for other topics like, you know, not mowing your lawn in the month of May um, or, uh, you know, trying to avoid, you know, don't wear your shoes in the house um, to keep toxic chemicals down, don't wear perfume and cologne because they're toxic chemicals that are don't mean to be too brutal here but like poisoning you and everybody around you um and and it costs money for them as well so stop wearing them save some money save the planet you know save each other um so there's a list of uh different um suggestions on there on that website so anyways i will leave it there thank you for your attention and i hope that this was of interest